Good evening. My name is Mark Syme. I am the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to our evening services for Sunday, July the 7th. We'll sing a few songs, observe the Lord's Supper, and have a message that I hope will uh, lift us all up just a little bit. Here at Northfield, we sing from the songbook, Songs of Faith and Praise. Don't know if you have that book. I will give you the number of the name of the song. If you have another book or you want to Google the song to sing along, um, please do so. The first song that we will sing in our book is number 580, 580. The title of the song is The Joy of the Lord. The Joy of the Lord. <clears throat> The joy of the Lord is my strength. 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 He heals the brokenhearted and they cry no more. He heals the brokenhearted and they cry no more. He heals the brokenhearted and they cry no more. The joy of the Lord is my strength. He gives me living water and I thirst no more. He gives me living water and I thirst no more. He gives me living water and I thirst no more. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And if you have our songbook, uh, don't change openings. Number 578. 578. The title of this song is We Will Glorify. 578. We Will Glorify. <coughs> We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship him in righteousness. We will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to him we give. Hallelujah to the King of Kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. And before we partake of the Lord's Supper, turn your song books to number 383. Three. 83, Jesus, keep me near the cross. 383, Jesus, keep me near the cross. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain. Free to all a living stream Flows from Calvary's mountain 
In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest me on the river near the cross a trembling soul love and mercy found me there the bright and morning star sheds its beams around me in the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest me on the river. Near the cross, O Lamb of God, bring its scenes before me. Help me walk from day to day with its shadow on me. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest me on the river. It is time uh, in our service that we observe the Lord's Supper. We do so that it, because in the night Jesus was betrayed, he instituted this Lord's Supper as he took the Passover with his disciples. And with that, uh, he explained to them uh, his coming fate, and he explained to them uh, what would befall him. And uh, he wanted the Lord's Supper to be a memorial. And we find that it was to be an eternal memorial, uh, a memorial that we remember that God gave his only son, sent him to earth in the form of a human being and allowed him to die upon the cross. His death upon the cross was for the forgiveness of our sins. Uh, his body that was racked in pain uh, took the pain of our sins. The blood that he shed was the blood that washes away our sins. And so every first day of the week, as we are instructed, uh, we uh, uh, take time to break bread together, just as they did in the 20th chapter of Acts, in the seventh verse at Troas. They gathered together on the first day of the week to break bread. And so uh, with that in mind, as we have the memorial before us, help us to do so uh, just as Jesus instructed. Let's pray for the bread. We're so grateful, dear Heavenly Father, that you were willing to send Jesus to us, that he was willing to bear the sins of the world on the cross, that his body was racked in pain, a crown of thorns uh, upon his head, and uh, he was uh, just chastised, and that chastisement was for us. Help us as we partake of this bread to remember his body that he gave for us. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. We are in remembrance of the blood that Jesus shed for each one of us. We know that it is the blood that uh, he shed, the, the life blood, as the life ebbed from his life, uh, that was shed for us. That blood is uh, 
denotes that uh, our sins might be forgiven and washed away. And so as we partake of this fruit of the vine, let's remember the innocent blood that Jesus shed for each one of us. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Not specifically related to the Lord's Supper, but in some ways it is. On the first day of the week, we are instructed to lay by and store and give back to the Lord that which we have prospered. And so it is at this time that uh, we think of the blessings of life that we have and the blessings that we have, that we have the church that <coughs> Jesus gave his life up for. And uh, as we think of that, we think of the, the mission of our church here to seek and save the lost, to help those in need. And so as we come to this part of our service, help us to purpose in our heart to give, uh, knowing that we give what is uh, yours uh, and we just give back to you. Uh, let's pray for the giving. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, as we give to be cheerful givers. Help us to be sacrificial givers. Help us to understand that just as Jesus sacrificed himself for us, at this time we're asked to make a small monetary sacrifice and give it back so that uh, the church and those that are in charge of these funds will do what the church is intended to do, to indeed seek and save the lost, to help those who are in need. Bless us as we give. Help us to do so with an open heart and an open mind. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. <laughs> the last song that we'll sing is one that's very familiar to, to us. It is number 83 in our book. The title is God is So Good. Number 83, God is So Good. <clears throat> God is so good, God is so good, God is so good, He's so good to me. He cares for me, He cares for me. He cares for me, he's so good to me. I love him so, I love him so, I love him so, he's so good to me. Answers prayer. He answers prayer. He answers prayer. He's so good to me. I know that I was lifted up by singing praises to the Lord. I pray that the Lord accepted those as praises from our hearts as to how we feel about our God and about his son, Jesus Christ. If you were there this evening, you may have listened to the title of the lesson and wondered what is uh, Mark up to this evening. Uh, uh, the title of my lesson is, and it's in the term, I guess, of a question, everything happens for a reason? Hmm. Everything happens for a reason. After terrible accidents, perhaps natural disasters, uh, I hear people say all the time, well, uh, everything happens for a reason. And so what I would like to explore this evening is, 
does everything happen for reason? What do they mean? What do people mean by that statement? Maybe you and I have used it ourselves. Is it a biblically based idea that everything happens for a reason? And here's the meat and the heart of my lesson this evening. Whether or not one realizes it, that statement comes from the idea that all actions are controlled by fate or are predestined. That's what it is. It's fate. It was destiny. Is that biblical? Here's a better definition of fate or fatalism. Here's what it says. Fatalism is the belief that events are predetermined by fate or destiny and that humans cannot do anything to change them. One might also express this idea in this way. Fatalists believe that everything happens that has already been decided by some higher power. And there is nothing we can do to change it. And so my question again is, is that a biblical concept? Well, what I would like to look first of all to is there is a basic error in all of this. And the error in it says and implies that humans do not have free will. In this age, we might say that God created robots and he has the clicker. He has the control. He presses the button and uh, this is what happens. The question the we might ask is, why in the world would God make humans and put them on earth if all their actions were already predetermined to happen? This, I think, attacks the nature of God as a loving God. Can it be said that God loves one when he's predetermined that this person will do something contrary to God's love? To me, this violates the nature of God that involves justice. Justice means that everyone is treated fairly. We all have the same opportunities as everyone else. Is it fair to assume that um, someone will do something that is contrary to God's standard and then God will punish that person because he or she has violated that standard? That's not even acceptable for humans to treat one another that way much less for loving God to treat his people that way. If this was true, why would the scriptures tell us that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling? If our salvation has already been worked out for us, <clears throat> why bother? There's nothing to work for. It is already, and our fate has already been predestined. Human free will is taught in the Bible. That statement that I made, that we are to work out our salvation with fear and with trembling, I think substantiates that. Anyone who has ever lived or who will live will stand before Jesus Christ, the judge. Acts chapter 17 and 31 explains this to us. He will judge 
the world with righteousness, the scripture says. Well, what's that mean? Why have a judgment when one does not have the ability to choose his or her actions? There's no reason to have a judgment because we've been prejudged. Paul puts this in very stark terms in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. If we were predestined already, none of this would matter. We can be like the rich man that tore his barns down. We can eat, drink, and be merry. And with that, there is no tomorrow. But there was for this man. His soul was required of him that night. If <laughs> predestination were uh, alive and well, and it was all faded, um, <laughs> this, this story would not even be in the Bible. Now, let's get down to the root of all of this. Understand that our life is like a parade. God can look down from on high and see our lives. He can understand our lives the way certainly human being, beings cannot. And one of the great attributes of God is his ability to know all things. And so the question might be asked, if God knows all things, and he does, does that mean he determines all that a person does? No. No. Jesus was tempted, wasn't he? Satan took Jesus to the mountaintop. And he tempted Jesus, just as you and I are tempted by things today. God doesn't tempt us, but the world is the, what the world is. And we must choose what things we will do. We must choose to live godly lives. We must choose to be Christ-like. It is our choice not our destiny. Um, if destiny were the case, uh, then God does make everyone do whatever he does. And this, I, I believe, stands in violation of God's loving nature. Can he know what is going to happen without making it happen? Yes. Can a person know what is going to happen without causing it to happen? Hmm. An, an interesting uh, concept. Let me give you an example. Let's say we had a son and a daughter. And uh, someone brought two gifts for them. And the buyer of the gifts, not their parents, just someone who gave them gifts, put the gifts before them and let them choose which gift each wants and yet know ahead of time which gift the child will choose. Now, you know, if we as parents knew what the gifts were, we might have an inkling of which child would choose which gift. We might know them well enough. However, did the parents make the children choose those gifts? No. Foreknowledge does not have to include predestination. We may have an idea of what they would choose, but they are not destined to make that choice. If we're standing at the top of the mountain which has a one-way road on the top 
and you see a car going down and a car coming up around a curve and they are about to run into one another. Did you make them crash? No. But from where you are, you can see the inevitability of the crash. You can know what's going to happen, but you didn't make it happen. So from where God stands and sees, he may know what is going to happen, but he doesn't make it happen. To foreknow something means to foreordain something. And that just isn't the way the world is. Speaking of the death of Jesus, the Apostle Peter put in these terms, This man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men, and put him to death. That's in Acts chapter 2, verse 23. Because God is omniscient, because he knows everything, did not mean that he made those involved in putting Jesus to death take the action they took. God didn't make them nail Jesus to the cross. They decided to do that. That's part of the sermon that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost when the people asked, what must we do? And so, based on evidence that I hope I have presented well this evening, the conclusion must be that because something happens, that doesn't mean that it had to happen. Thus, it did uh, it did not happen for a reason. It happened because of circumstance where people had this free will. Our lesson, hmm, I believe, is a salient one. And it's a one that should be important to each one of us. Rather than say, everything happens for a reason, one ought to say, what lesson can I learn from what happened? What lesson can I learn from what happened? It's why we study history. We don't study history to remember times and dates. We study history so that we won't make the same mistakes that people made before and put them in the predicament that they're in. This idea of what lesson we can learn from what happened looks to the future, whereas the idea that everything happens for a reason looks to the past. Some like to say everything happens for a reason to avoid being held responsible for what he or she did. We are indeed accountable for each and every one of our actions. When we stand before the judgment seat of God as the Apostle Paul so wonderfully expressed to us in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10. And it bears reading again. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. What we do, good or bad, is like playing a tennis match. When the person hits the ball to our side, the ball is now in our court. 
we will determine the outcome ourselves. We will either hit the ball back over the net to the other side, or we'll swing and miss and we'll hit it out of bounds. But the ball is on our racket. The ball is in our court. That's the way our lives are. Our lives are such that God gives us the will to do what we want to do. We're not robots. We are flesh and blood, human people, created in the spiritual image of God. God controls the world, but he does not control each one of our actions. If this were so, there would be no need for judgment that uh, our fate would have been uh, sealed already. And so when you hear that term, everything happens for a reason. Look at it with a, uh, a clear eye and understand that uh, this is not a scriptural concept. If so, then free will would not be in our lives. We are called upon to live godly lives. And how do we do that? Well, in the Lord's word, he put forth a plan so that we can become one of his children. We can take Jesus into our lives and we can become Christians. We can become children of God. If after hearing the word and believing it, if we repent of our former ways and confess Jesus as the Son of God and then are baptized for the remission of our sins, we can become children of God. This is our first step to salvation. And then until we take our last breath, we are to live godly lives, controlled by the Spirit of God within us that tells us the difference in right and wrong. And then we make the choice. If you're not a Christian this evening and you know what you have to do, get in touch with one of us. We will be there to help you to become a child of God. Let's finish this with a prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the time that we've had together this evening. Bless us as we understand this, this concept of, of whether uh, everything happens for a reason or not. Help us to understand that you play an obvious integral part in our lives. You have written down for us through your Holy Spirit the way we ought to live our lives. But it is up, it is up to us to make the choice to do the things that are good or to do the things that are evil. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father, that we will make the right decisions, that we will want to be more Christ-like in our lives, and we will do those godly things that will one day, when we stand before the judgment seat of Jesus, he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant, and that we will enter into eternity with him. Bless us this evening. Help us to rest upon our pillow with the thought that uh, our God is a living God and that Jesus died for our sins. Be with us and bless us. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all. God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above.